All right, so any questions you guys have so far? Anything that is not clear? All right, so the previous examples that I gave you of the free Fermi gas, it's a quantum mechanical theory, right? That takes into account how electrons move inside of a box, but they were not interacting with anything. They were not interacting with the other electrons. They were not interacting with all of the other ions. So that theory is due to Sommerfeld. And he was just using the Hamiltonian without any potential and uh, Fermi Dirac statistics to do this, right? So Sommerfeld's theory of the free electron gas is actually a really good approximation to studying some metals. And by metals, I mean the simplest ones, which is copper, silver, and gold. For instance, platinum, which is just next to gold in the periodic table, is not going to be explained its properties by the free electron gas, but those three are. So they're almost free in that case. And we could also use it to explain the group one elements. So lithium, sodium, uh, potassium as metals can also be explained by this theory of free electron gas. But there's one problem, right? This is good as a starting point, but there's one issue that is, how do you explain that the electrons are gonna sneak by all of the ions without crashing into them? So you have all of these ions in the middle, and according to the theory, the electron doesn't even interact with those ions. So how do they sneak through those ions? So think about it this way. Let's say you get up and you run through the classroom. You're running through the classroom and not crashing into chairs. How do you do that? You're moving super fast. You don't crash into chairs. Well, you would go through the spaces in between, right? And you're channeling through here, through there, but you cannot move in this direction unless there's a space in between the chairs. But they didn't know how to explain it. How does this work in real systems? So they said, we have a good approximation, but how does it work? In fact, if you look at the resistance that you're getting, the resistance by measuring an experiment, and then you compare that to the values that you get from the Sommerfield theory of how much do electrons travel before they scatter off an ion, you would see that they're moving microns in length. So if all of the atoms are separated about one, let's say one nanometer, right? They're passing through thousands of lattices of ions before crashing into one ion. So that's crazy. And they were wondering, how does this work? Especially when they saw that, and, and when I say them, this is the mean free path, how much distance they can cover before they crash into something, right? And they were thinking like, this is crazy. And the lower the temperature we go into, the longer this distance gets. So electrons can move and don't scatter and they take giant uh, thousands of, of rows of atoms before they crash into something. So the spacing, so electrons are point particles. So their size is that they're a tiny little point, right? They don't have any structure. Right. And then the distance between atoms is a few Armstrongs, three Armstrongs to maybe at most 10. So not exactly, so let's get into that. Not completely exactly, so. There's this very famous individual who did his dissertation, PhD dissertation under Heisenberg. You guys know Heisenberg from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So this guy, Bloch, um, figured it out and wrote his thesis about this. 
So he took a single electron moving in a periodic potential. So it's perfectly periodic potential. He solved that problem. Then he said, um, let me read this. I found to my delight that the wave differ from the plane wave of free electrons only by a periodic modulation. This was so simple that I didn't think it could be much of a discovery. But when I showed it to Heisenberg, he said right away, that's it. So Heisenberg saw the, the solution to this problem that his PhD student is giving to him and got super excited. Bloch thought this is trivial, right? It's probably not that important. And this other guy is like, wow, Eureka, you found it. So that's what happened. So then what happened is the problem before is how, why is it that this mean free path is so long, right? Electrons are traveling thousands of rows of atoms and not, not uh, hit any of them. So this is a hard question. And once Bloch solved this problem, the question became, why is the mean free path so short actually? So that was the, how it, this solution that he found completely changed everything. So Sommerfeld had the free electron gas theory. Bloch had the electron gas in periodic potential. So those are small modifications to that problem first solved by Sommerfeld, small modification done by Bloch, and then now you can explain almost everything. Let's see. Um, what happens then is that the scattering of the electron is not caused by the lattice, right? So think about it this way. If you were in this room running back and forth between the rows, right? You're an electron. When is it that you, you would be hitting something? That would be when one of the chairs got put in the wrong place, right? So let's say you get up of your chair and you move it when you get up and now it's a little bit in this direction. So whoever is running through here, that's where they would trip. So it's basically that it's not that the electrons are scattering of the lattice of ions, the lattice of chairs, but actually they're just scattering out of the defects. When some ion is misplaced by a little bit, that's where they would scatter off. So that's what, what they would be hitting. They would be hitting the defects in the lattice. And this lattice of ions, right? The lattice of ions is moving because of temperature. So the hotter it is, the more that the ions are vibrating. So at hotter temperatures, they're gonna scatter more of the ions because they can move back and forth a little bit more. So now think about it as the temperature gets higher, these chairs start growing like this. Would you be able to run in between them without falling down? All right, and then the other thing is, uh, you could also have impurities, which is one different chair gets put in there. So you're running through it and instead of having just a normal desk chair, you see now a little couch in there. So that would be your impurity, right? So now you hit the couch all the time. Well, that's what an impurity is. So that's uh, what Bloch discovered. And that's how you can explain a lot of the experiments that are done. So let's look at a single electron in a periodic potential. So this is going back to what kind of simplification we're doing. Sommerfeld's simplification is the simplest one. You solve Hamiltonian of just the electrons moving, kinetic term. Um, blocks is adding a term for the potential, but it's not just any simple potential, it's a potential that repeats periodically and has a period in it. Electrons are not talking to each other yet, so there's no interaction between electrons. They just have a potential that is periodic next to them. So those are the simplifications that we have now to look at. So free electron gas, you're treating the electrons, you're treating the solids as if they are just empty boxes. 
with electrons that don't interact with each other. They're not interacting with nuclei or anything. And you only take into account the Pauli exclusion principle. So Bloch's idea is to add a new term for this simple, simple solid that you can solve, get a solution for. So this is a static potential. So let's say that you had this potential at it. So this is just some generic potential that you're gonna put. If you have a generic potential and you were gonna solve the Hamiltonian is equal to this kinetic term, plus now this one, just having a generic potential makes the problem impossible, right? You cannot solve it for a generic potential. There's no way to do it. But you have solutions that you learn in your quantum class in your physics, modern physics and such, where for some particular cases of that potential, you can solve it, right? In this case, the potential then is periodic. And now what we have is that if we take this R, and this R is identical to the R from the last class, where we had, in this case, for a square lattice or a cubic lattice, right? We had vectors that fit in there with some uh, primitive vectors times integers. So that's, that's the periodicity of the system. If this is true, then now we have our periodic potential. Does that make sense? So this is how the potential varies, right? You had a question? Two M square? No, it should be just two M. Yeah, sorry. Wanted to put squares everywhere. So now this is how the potential is periodic through this term right here. The little r is position. This is the term that tells you that you have a periodicity in the system. So this is the periodic potential. And R is from the Braves lattice that we talked about last class. Questions? No? All right, so now let's think about this as a one dimensional model that we're gonna solve for, okay? So this is the Hamiltonian that we're looking at. When we're solving this Hamiltonian, this is simple enough that we can solve it. I think depending on what potential you stick in there, you can solve them analytically even but it's capturing more than that other one here. And now it has more realis realism than before. So it has simplicity and realism inside of it. We see something here, and this is a translational symmetry that happens. You take this potential, sorry, you take this potential and you look at it at a position R away and you get the same value as before. So that's one symmetry, and that's what we're adding that is really important. Even though it's still simple enough that we can solve it, we just made it that it has lattice symmetry. Um, and it makes it so that the solutions are hard, but not super hard, so we can find them. And it gives you having this term right here with that periodic potential, it gives you a little bit more realism because we can solve for crystals and some of them are gonna be metal, some of them are gonna be semiconductors or insulators. So having this extra term is giving us not just the simplest metals like copper, silver, and gold, but actually is giving us a lot of the periodic table 
And with this simplification, simple enough thing, we're able to solve things like that. So let me try to draw this salute. So let's say that this is one dimensional. This is my variable X. And that the potential is gonna be, let's say like this periodic. So it's supposed to be periodic. And actually what I'm gonna do is assume that this potential this is the potential, but it's also gonna go around like this and go back on itself. Does that make sense? So it's repeating in a sense. So you have the same thing. And then if I look over here, it's gonna be the same thing. And it goes like that. So we have two periodicities here. The first one is the distance from here to here this distance I'm gonna call A. So that would be from this point right here to this point right here. Assume that this is not, that they're all identical looking, right? This one and this one are exactly the same potential. They're just displaced by this distance I, A. And then the other thing is that, it, that this whole thing going around like this goes from zero to L, okay? So it's the whole thing. So if let's say right here is zero, halfway through is L over two, and then right here is L. So that's how it's periodic. So if I were to draw it like this, right? This is zero, this is L over two, and then this is also L. Okay, that's what I'm trying to draw, but from the side. Questions? No? All right. So let's write Schrodinger equation for this system. We're doing it with that Hamiltonian that we know how to do already. This is one dimensional and the one dimension is on the X direction. So now we have a single electron trying to find what solutions we would get. And this Hamiltonian would give us back, applying this Hamiltonian to this wave function X would give us back the energy times the wave function like that. So this A is the period of U of X. And then another thing, X goes from zero to L, right? So this wave function is defined in the same space. All right, question so far? No? Good. So, um, like I told you before, when we did this, Solving for this Schrodinger equation is not complicated, right? It's easy to do. The only thing that you need to do is you have the differential equation in there, and now you have to set boundary conditions. What are the boundary conditions? Well, in this case, we're thinking a periodic system, and we're saying that it goes from zero to L like that, right? So the periodicity of the wave function
the, solu the solution that we're looking, this is our boundary condition, is that this psi of x is also periodic. So what that means is that psi of x plus l is the same as psi of x. So if I say this is x, right? Then the point y of x is here. And that's the same as y of x plus l because we just did one circle again. Okay. All right, any questions so far? Let's try to solve it now. Yeah. You want me to lower it? All right. So what's the easiest way to solve it? What would you do if you had to solve this Hamiltonian? What's the assumption that gets you the answer right away? Let's just assume that this is a potential equal to zero, right? That would be the easiest thing, right? Because then what are the solutions? Okay. Exactly. So now we have a little band here, a little index here, and the y of x, the psi of x is equal to e to the i k times x divided by this quantity, the square root of L, that is needed for the normalization, right? All right, so now let me tell you what Block found out. He actually didn't solve this problem. He actually put a periodic potential here something periodic and got a solution for it. He assumes some periodicity of it. Um, some periodicity of UR. I mean, we, with UR is equal to zero, we're already periodic, right? Because if it's zero here, and then you do one whole loop and it's zero again, you're already periodic. But what he did is that he did a real periodic potential and he found a solution. And this is the solution that he found. Okay, so this is a little tiny u. This is the solution that he had where u of x is a function
that is periodic with A, okay? And then this N is given to you if you divide the capital L, the length around it by A. So the way I see it is that, let's assume that this was this distance from here to here is A, right? All of this is L and you can see how many, what N is. So you can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So that's exactly what this N is. It would be this L perimeter divided by this distance A and you will get that 12. This is how many cells, A cells are in the periodic system L. So what he find is that the solution to the system where this U of R is periodic is given by a plane wave multiplied by a periodic function U of X. All right, questions so far? No? So let me try to draw this solution. So this is U of X and it's periodic. And then what the answer might look like So this is Y of X. And then the blue one would be maybe the solution of the plane wave, but you have the same periodicity that it gets modulated into the big plane wave. So the blue one is the plane wave. The black one is the wave function with that modulation. So all you're doing is that your wave function behaves kind of like the plane wave, but it's also getting multiplied by this periodicity that is because of the A lattice. Okay. All right. So any questions before we do the derivation, the block did, that got him a PhD and made Heisenberg say, that's it, you're a genius? No? All right, let's get into that. How many of you know Fourier transforms or Fourier theorem? You guys seen it? Fourier, Fourier, you haven't? All right. So what Fourier theorem tells you is that every function can be written as a sum of a complex exponential function. So if you wanna write a function, whatever function you have, let me write it here. You have a function, it's gonna be a sum and let me, a sum of case. Like that. 
it doesn't matter what function you want, you have. So this k can go from negative infinity to infinity. Any function that you want can be written as a summation. These are some coefficients, and this is this complex i k x exponential. So if you're writing a function that is uh, periodic, you could also write it this way. And that's what we're gonna do right now. So this is what the Fourier theorem tells you. Whatever function you have, you can write it as a summation of plane waves. All right, so if you have a periodic function, we have a periodic function it's not just a generic function, but a periodic function, then you're gonna find that the ones that have the same period as the periodic function are the ones that survive. So for instance, if you're writing, if you have this function like this, right? There's a periodicity from here to here. Maybe it's a sine, maybe it's a cosine. And this periodicity is the ones that survive here. And those coefficients are the ones that you would see the biggest. So some functions, when you just plan them into Fourier transform, into the Fourier components like this, you're gonna see that there's an infinite number of them. And then there's a few of them that are not, and there's just very simple way to write them. But that's what the Fourier theorem tells us. So what we wanna write is, We're gonna say that y of x is periodic. The period of y of x is L. So that means that y of x can be written as a sum of Fourier components. And So it's like this L again, right? So we have that term right here. And then it's a sum. I'm doing it over Q dash. These are my coefficients that depend on this Q dash. like that. So this term right here is a normalization. And now we know that Q, that Y of X is periodic, the periodicity is given to us by L. So because of that, Q prime has this periodicity inside of it. And it's gonna be some integer L times two pi divided by L. L prime is from negative infinity all the way negative one, zero, one, all the way to infinity. Any integer. So that's a way to write this wave function due to the Fourier theorem. We also have that the potential is periodic. But here, the period is A, right? And A is equal to L over N. That's my period for my potential. So again, I can write this potential as a summation of 
Fourier component. So u of x is equal to, now my sum is over this quantity capital K. This is capital K. And this is a coefficient u of k. It's almost the same as above, right? Except that over here, I'm summing over q. Here, I'm summing over k. But remember that this summation is just like a dummy variable that goes in there. The only difference now is that this k has the periodicity of the lattice. The periodicity is not over big L, capital L, but over A, that's my periodicity now, okay? And this L is just a variable, again, an integer just like this one. All right, any questions up to there? So we can substitute this two into the Hamiltonian. And let's do that. Our Hamiltonian is given by derivative with respect to x squared of y of or psi of x times the potential u of x psi of x and this should be equals to the energy times psi of x so if i have those two then you see that first i have to take derivatives with respect to x of this guy. So what happens when you take the derivative with respect to x of this thing that is an exponential with respect to x? Exactly. And then you're doing that twice, right? Okay, awesome. So if we do that, we get this term right here is gonna be, first is a summation over q's right, this Q prime. So we have this summation over Q. Then I'm gonna have th this, this term is, let me just forget a, a little bit uh, for it, of it for a little bit. Then we're gonna have this, but we're bringing this IQ twice down, right? So the ne there's a negative sign because i times i is negative, but we also have a negative sign here. The two negative signs cancel out. And then I get the q squared. And then this part stays the same, e to the i q prime. Oh, this is q prime two, q prime x. All right, questions about that part? So, that's the second derivative. Then we have to do this multiplication and is this one times this one. So multiplying this one times this one. And in this case, we have a double summation. One of the sum is over Q, the other one is over capital K. And if we sum, if we multiply this exponential times this exponential, the exponents just add up together, right? So I'm gonna have I Q prime plus capital K X. 
And then I have this term and this UK, UK term to take into account. Okay, and then I just have to add this energy and then I'll have the summation over Q prime e to the I Q prime X psi of Q prime. There was a term here, so this is energy, right? There was a term here that goes one over the square root of L, but then it's in all of the terms so I can get rid of it. So that's why I don't put that one in there. All right, questions at this point? So this you have done in maybe math methods, maybe in ENM. This equation has to hold for all of the components, right? So this is what's cool about Fourier. Now we know that all of these terms have to obey for all of these possible Q values. For all of the coefficients, this equation holds because we know that that's what we spanned it. So what we do now is that, and you have done this over and over and over in those two classes, at least math methods and ENM. You, can, you know that they apply for all of the components independent of each other. And now you can do summation, these summations and start integrating things together. And then a bunch of them cancels out because of the way that you integrate this with another coefficient similar to this one. So you've done this already, I hope, right? And, um, we have conditions that have to be applied. So this is a condition for this coefficients. And what is the other condition? So if we take this equation and multiply by um, the exponential of negative i q x over capital L and integrate from zero to L, right? So we're gonna multiply that equation by this one. And then things that you can do, one of the steps that you would need to do in the middle is that we would have this expression, this is the integral, and then we would be doing dx e to the i q prime minus q of x dx. Oh, I already put the dx in the front. So if we were to do this, multiply by this much, and then do this part, you would see that there's terms that would look like this. How many of you have done this integral before? So this is one that you do in maybe math methods. Or in ENM. You guys remember that one? No? Okay, so the solution to this one is the Kronecker delta that says that this is zero. This integral is zero when Q and Q prime are not the same. And it's one when Q and Q prime are the same. So that's what you get from one of the integrals. If you do the other integral that you have to do when doing this multiplication and integration is that you're gonna get one over L, again, the integral from zero to L dx. And in this case is e to the i Q prime plus capital k minus q times x. And this is the same as this one, 
Q prime, Q minus capital K. So again, this integral right here says that this is zero, except when this Q prime right here, this Q prime, and these two guys are the same. Okay. So that's our two integrals that maybe you've seen before, maybe not, but that's all they're saying. So it's either zero or one. So if we do if we do this, take this Hamiltonian, multiply it by that guy, and then integrate. We get Okay, so that's the solution. Once you do the whole multiplication and integrating all of the terms together. Um, so if Q and Q prime have to be the same, that sum over there over the Q primes only spits out a Q. And that's the only term that survives when this Q and Q prime are the same. So therefore you have this Q square and Psi of Q. And it's the same over here where this Q prime and this K have to be matched up together here. All right, so this might seem complicated, but we just got the answer to the problem. So if we grab that, that equation, and we have now rewrite it. And let me tell you what I did. This guy right here, right? What was that? That was our plane wave by itself. So if we take that plane wave right here. So, so if we have just uh, there's the momentum part of it, of the Hamiltonian working on psi, the solution to that is the plane wave solution, right? And that's just the energy of the plane wave. So that's why this part became this one. This is the energy of the plane wave for some value of Q. And this one is this term over here. And those two get multiplied by psi Q. And then instead of writing Q prime over there, I just wrote it like this. And we have the delta function taking care of one of our plane waves, sorry, one of our summations. So this delta function is sticking it in here and I get that I don't have to do the two summations, I just have to do one. Questions? Uh, all right. So is this nice or not yet? You guys see it or not yet? No? So this is Schrodinger's equation. Now it's in, This is Schrodinger's equation 
but in momentum space, in Fourier space. So you haven't seen this solved like this in quantum because it's a little bit more complicated, but it's the same as what Schrodinger equation says, except now this is in momentum space. So instead of being in this Q is your momentum and you don't have a R position. So this is not the Schrodinger equation in real space, it's the Schrodinger equation in Fourier space. And that's what we needed to do to solve it, going to this Fourier space to do it. But it's the same as Schrodinger equation in Fourier space, but each solution has that, it has a nice, it's, it's, each solution is a function of Q But this solution is zero, except at some values of Q that have the periodicity of the system. So because this Q, and let me go back over here to this point where we graph Q, this Q is defined over the lattice space, right? The positions of L, L is important, and then this L integers are important. The solutions are gonna depend on integer values. And it's only for particular integer values that you actually get a non-zero solution. All the other times this is zero plus zero is equal to zero. Zero plus zero is equal to zero. Except sometimes you're gonna have that this is a particular value of Q and this match together so that this one is not zero and this one is not zero yet when they add together, add up to zero. So most of the time the solutions are zero, except for very few particular integers where the solution of Q, the integers that go into Q that are not zero. And those are the important ones because those are the allowed ones. So yeah, this is really cool. I like how you phrased it. Q, you can think of Q as an real numbers, right? So those of you that have taken real analysis or maybe seen such analysis, I don't remember, know that the real numbers is, there's an infinite number of them, right? Even if you look between zero and one, there's an infinite number of them. That makes sense? So there are so the Q goes from negative infinity to infinity in the reals. But the solutions that we have are gonna be that we have let me write it here. Between zero and one, there's an infinite, infinite number of real numbers in the real line, zero and one. Between negative one and one, there's also an infinite, right? But there's integers, it would be negative one, zero and one. Now, if you go to from negative infinity to infinity in the real line, there's an infinite number of integers, right? Because they go from negative infinity through zero all the way to infinity. There's an infinite amount of integers, but there's even more infinite number of real values. So does that make sense? So Q, you can think of it as all the possible Qs are the real numbers, but then you have an infinite number of solutions that correspond to integers, and those integers go with this delta function, and you get that. So there's like an infinite number of solutions, but they just fit in the integer values 
versus the real line that has everything in between filled. So I don't remember what the term is for this, but there's an infinite number of integers, but there's not as many as reals, even though there's also an infinite number of reals. How's, what is that called, compact or, you guys remember? I took this like 20 years ago. <laughs> so those are the solutions that are available. You have this Q value here, this Q value, this big K, and then the little K from the plane wave times this modulation that we have as the solution. So this is the solution that Bloch came, back, uh, came up with, and let me rewrite it by, so this is the solution. This is in, in Q value, right? In Fourier space. So let's take an inverse Fourier transform of this solution and see what it looks like in real space. So the way to take the inverse Fourier transform, so the Fourier transform was this uh, multiplication by e i k x. So now to do this, the inverse one means that we take that summation again, q prime, we have the summation with k, we have the delta, Except now it's Q prime right here, capital K, lowercase k, U k, this little u right here, k, times my e to the i k prime x. So that's how I go from, that's to go between Fourier, to the Fourier transform is e to the negative i k x, and the inverse one is this same multiplication, but with this e to the i k x. So it's going back and forth, it's just a negative. And then doing the summation or integration, whichever way you wanna do it. I think the notation is different for engineers. Engineers do things opposite of what we do. It doesn't make sense. So if we do that, I still have the one over the square root of L. Now I'm gonna take this delta function right here to take care of this summation. So we have the summation over the capital K and then this term UK right here and E to the I, this one, right? Is the one that is gonna be changing. capital K plus little lowercase k of X. So now that's how I get rid of one of the sums, signs with the delta functions. And this can actually be rewritten as e to the i k x u of x and then here is my normalization constant where u of x little u of x is one over the square root of a Capital, the sum over k, capital K values, my u of k, e to the i, capital K, x. So this 
N and A were related, right? N is equal to L over A. So if we do N and A together, we get back our L. All right, so at this point, this is Bloch's solution. This is Bloch's solution to the problem. What Bloch saw at this point, right? So he did the Fourier transform to solve it. Then he do inverse Fourier transform to look what his solutions look like. And he got this. So what Bloch found is, oh, I get a plane wave times some periodic function that depends on the periodicity of the potential. So it's not the potential, it's another function. It's not the potential because this guy is what you get from this transformation, right? So this is not the potential, it was just the coefficients of the potential. So it's not exactly the potential. But what he's doing is when my particle, let's go back over here. When my particle is moving in a free electron gas, I get the Sommerfeld solution, which is just plane waves. And then this is what Bloch found. When the particle moves in the, under the influence of this periodic potential, my solutions are plane waves times a small function that goes in there. So that's the difference between this one and this one. They're both free waves, but this one is a free wave multiplied by a small potential, by a small function. So plane wave, this is the same solution. In fact, if you take your potential to be zero, right? Because the potential is zero, these coefficients will always be zero, and therefore u of x is zero, so you get the same solution as if the potential was not there. But the second piece is just this periodic function that has the period of the potential, and it has the same periodicity as the potential, and that's it. So the notation is now So this is the modern notation. So what we do now is that we say there's a solution and this solution depends on a k value k number times x and this solution is e to the i k x, then some function u k of x divided by this normalization constant. And again, this one is x plus a is equal to X e to the I K A. And this K is the wave vector of the plane wave. All right, any questions? No? You guys sure everything was super clear? You can tell me the truth. I'm not going to be offended. All right. Yeah. So in the final, so are these still uppercase K's? Uh, no, these are lowercase, all of them. Yeah. So the main thing is that your potential 
produces these functions u of k's. I k x. Oh no, that's just I k a. No, that's just I k a because this is the periodicity. So this is important, okay? This guy right here is the wave function at this point. So let's do that again over here in the circle. So this is my system, right? So here we will have All right, so here is zero. This is A, and this is also L, right? 2A, 3A, and such. What do I know? The potential at A is equal to the potential at 2A. Okay, make sense? Now for the wave function at A, is that equal to the wave function as 2a? Cosmo, what do you think? Is that true? Actually, no. This one and this one are the same. This one are not. Yeah, uh, because the principle by the logic, uh, uh, by that you say I pay after. Right. But if we do this, we do get this one is the same as this one times this modulation. What is important is that if I have this one, this two are the same. So this wave function has this L periodicity. The potential has this A periodicity. But to go, so your wave function doesn't look the same here and here. Your potential does. The wave function can look different as you go across. And the distance that it goes across is what you are modifying it by this much. Okay. All right. So now let me give you, I have a couple of minutes. Let me give you the following. So this is gonna be my potential. So far, we have been talking about a generalized periodic potential. No actual definition of what the potential looks like. So here it's zero. This is the x potential, the x direction. So let's say that your potential actually look like this. And it continues like that, and it has this periodicity being A. So Derek, you haven't solved wave functions yet in quantum? You have? Have you done the delta function? Yes, one delta function, and then you have either positive or negative delta function, but you have that, right? All right, so if you take in modern, physics, I don't think you get to cover delta functions. But in quantum, intro to quantum, you, did, you do get to see them. I don't know what part of the book you get to see them, at what portion, but you get to see them. For the delta functions, which would look like this one, right? Like I could say these are deltas and ask it to solve it. What you're doing is that you're solving for the solution and you're matching boundaries, and then you can solve it. So that's the way that you do it, delta functions or a different potential, right? Now, the reason here is that these are periodic. 
and we can solve for the eigenvalues of them and do all that by solving it in one of these. We don't have to do the infinite number of them. We just have to solve for this region. And now we know that when they go to the different potential, they're gonna be adding this modulation to them. So you don't have to solve it all over the place. You just solve it between here and here. And now you know with Bloch's theorem, how they're gonna look everywhere else. And you have that periodicity there to solve it. So if you have delta functions like that, I'm gonna sketch what the solution looks like actually for first the free electron gas. So this is gonna be the energy and this is gonna be your um, value of K. So for the free electron gas, That's the solution, right? So it turns out that this solution looks like this, like a parabola. Make sense? All right. So now let me bring this over. For a particular potential that is periodic, we get this thing right here that depends on K and this is the eigenfunctions. Well, we can, now that we have the eigenfunctions, we have the eigenvalues too. So we can solve what the energy is. And if we do the energy, um, let me do the following. So this is a particular Q, particular K. So what happens is the following. All right, I didn't draw it right. Let me zoom in. This is the free electron gas solution. And this one right here, like this, electron gas with periodic potential. So at some particular values of K, there's a deviation from it. And this deviation makes it so that there's a energy range right here where there's no solution. Because this guy, instead of going like this, the plane wave, he just went down like this. Does that make sense? So this solution goes down. This solution, instead of being here, it goes up over here and then catches back up to it. So then for the free electron gas, it was a periodic function. For this one, it goes like this. And then like this like that. 
and then there's a particular energy range where there's no like they're supposed to go almost together except near this boundary and this boundary and this boundary and so forth so this region from here to here is an energy gap you have that there's no eigenstates with this particular energy here when you look at the free electron gas for every value of k for every value of the energy you can find a value where that there's a k so if this was from zero to let's say 10, and this is at 15, between 10 and 15, there's no eigenstates in there. You can find an eigenstate, an energy, uh, an eigenstate of the system for all of the energies between zero to 10, between 15 and 30, but not between 10 and 15. There's an empty gap in there does that make sense and this is due to this periodic potential that you have this opening in the bands in the band structure of the system all right any questions this is it for today you guys have any questions about the homework Uh-huh. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so go ahead. Yeah. So it, it is transducing. What do you mean? Um like on the analogy. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So this is my eigenstates. Uh-huh. Okay, that's the eigenstate. Right. So this is the solutions to the wave function. Okay. And then my energy is you, 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 you put this into the Hamiltonian uh -huh. and you can find what the energies are. Those are my eigenvalues. Okay. So if we take any periodic potential that, and this is one that I can solve for either on the computer or by hand, it would take me a couple of hours to do it by hand, right? But you guys can do it too. I would get these gaps right here. That's the important thing as compared as when we're just doing the plane waves that it doesn't take too long to find the eigenvalues because the plane waves is just this eigenvalues. For this one, it's a little bit different and you have to go and do this, basically figure out what this is for your potential. All right, so with that, we're done for today. You guys have a great, um, we can